I'm James Taylor, and you're listening to the Super Creativity Podcast, a show dedicated to inspiring creative minds like yours. What can the secret world of counterintelligence teach us about problem solving and creativity? That's what my guest today and I will discuss. Robert Hannigan was director of GCHQ, the UK's largest technical and cybersecurity agency. He established the UK National Cybersecurity Centre in 2016 and was responsible for the UK's first cyber strategy in 2009. He was previously the Prime Minister's security advisor at Number 10 and worked closely with Tony Blair for a decade on the Northern Ireland peace process. Robert is now International Chairman of Blue Voyant, a global cybersecurity services company, and was a senior advisor to McKinsey & Co., He is a senior fellow at the Belfer Centre at Harvard. He is a fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology in London and an honorary fellow at Oxford University. He was honoured by Queen Elizabeth for his services to national security and is one of the only non-US citizens to have received the US Intelligence Distinguished Public Service Medal. His new book, Counterintelligence, which is absolutely wonderful, is about what the secret world can teach us about problem solving and creativity. And it looks to answer a couple of questions. How do you hire smart people who can work together to prevent terrorist attacks and decode encrypted technology? How do you come up with creative counterintuitive solutions to solve major global problems? And how do you provide the right environment for these people to thrive and work at their best when under immense pleasure and it's my great pleasure to welcome robert hannigan on the super creativity podcast today welcome robert uh hi james well thanks very much very good to, to be with you so currently what has your focus you've got the, the book is is out now what are you currently focused on yeah so i've uh the book is out and i've obviously i have a role in oxford which takes a lot of time in, in term time and um then my main focus is on cyber security obviously which is my uh, my day-to-day work, and that's changing very fast. And every day we see new headlines, which kind of emphasise how how fast-moving and how sophisticated the threat has got. So, cybersecurity is where I spend uh, most of my most much of my thinking time. Now, in this book, I I learned so many interesting things. I learned a lot about Bletchley Park that I didn't know, and the work that went on there, and the history of of GCHQ. Um, but there was a, a, a quote that you have right towards, you mentioned something right at the beginning of the book, which I thought was interesting. The other day, um, I was in Austin in Texas and I was speaking, and this sounds very strange compared to what we would probably be talking about, but I was speaking for a company that is manufactures the ingredients for bread and pastries and chocolates. And while I was there, I met a gentleman who was the sourdough librarian for this company. <laughs> His job is to keep the sourdoughs of all, he goes around the world collecting sourdoughs from these amazing places and he has a library of this. And in the book earlier on, you say this, it is, uh, you talk about the work of, uh, of, of Bletchley Park and then GCHQ is less about mapping the DNA of Bletchley Park and more like identifying the ingredients of a digital sourdough starter, a messy blended fermentation that constantly changes that is never entirely within the baker's control but nonetheless produces something entirely surprising so my first question i had for you is what are the good ingredients for someone that's working in counter intelligence and has that changed over the years so i love the idea of a sourdough librarian that sounds fantastic (laughs) and austin texas is a great example actually of tech innovation at the moment but i'm sure you you saw when you were there um, what I was trying to answer, and I didn't want to write a, one of these prescriptive books that says do X, Y, and Z and you will have creativity because I just don't think it works like that. I was trying to answer the question of how was it that Bletchley Park, which um, was this not particularly impressive country house in the English countryside uh, where they gathered to break codes during the Second World War, um, and to solve one big problem, which was how do you decrypt and then use uh, a massive amount of uh, intercepted radio material that was coming coming into Bletchley and then get it out fast enough for commanders to use. So that was the problem they were trying to solve. But in solving it, they created the world's first digital programmable computer, Colossus. And so in the in in that problem solving process, there was this immense creativity. Um, and everything we now have, so what we're communicating on, our laptops, our uh, iPhones, uh, and and so on, you trace their lineage back to Bletchley Park, really. Uh, and so I wanted to explore, so how did that happen? And to come to your sourdough analogy, um, 
many people at the time described Bletchley as an asylum, as rudderless, as full of crazy people. Um, it wasn't, they thought, structured and hierarchical in the way it should have been. Um, and so what were the ingredients? Well, the ingredients were, of course, the people. Um, and it was this amazing mixture of people, um, not just mathematicians, not just Alan Turing types, if he is a type, um, the famous people but um, predominantly women. So 76% of the staff at Bletchley were women. Most were young, most were under 30. So you were quite old if you were um, over 30 and you were ancient if you were over 40 at Bletchley. Um, but it wasn't just mathematicians and academics. It was people from manufacturing, from banking, from department stores, um, it, from the, the telecoms world. Uh, and it was putting those people together both as disciplines and as individual ways of thinking and I'm, we might come on to neurodiversity but that's where the magic and the creativity came from and I think that's closer to a sourdough starter than it is to any kind of business book which tells you do this this and this and you'll get creativity the thing I find really interesting and you talk about this towards more towards the end of the book but it's actually the it's a bit of a thread that kind of goes through it is what you mentioned like neurodiversity and and, and we'll, we'll kind of come back to that but there were lots of talking about this building this kind of culture, and there was lots of very interesting characters, whether Bletchley Park and obviously now in, in GCHQ. One of the ones that made made me laugh was early on. You talked about um, Dilly Knox, I think was the was the name, and uh, Room Forty at the Old Admiralty. He uh, he decided to do something a little bit unusual, something to help his his creative process, uh, yeah. <laughs> which which I actually. I do today uh, uh, as well. So can, can, can you share what that was? Yeah, Diddy Knox was an amazing character, um, but he did a lot of his thinking in the bath. So he had a bathtub put into the old Admiralty building um, in Whitehall. And then when he moved it, nearly 20 years later to Bletchley Park, he had a bathtub put into the cottage there. And he would sit in it for hours and hours at a time. So much so, actually, in Bletchley that one of his colleagues thought he'd drowned and broke the door down. <laughs> so and it wasn't just an affectation. He didn't just occasionally go and have a bath. He, was, he would find it a good place to think. And we now know from um, uh, neurological research quite a lot about the effects of warm water, water in general, on the brain. Um, so he wasn't wrong. And he described it as... Say, as Bathing helps me with the perception of analogies. Yeah. So uh, not exactly sure what that means, but we think it closest to a kind of lateral thinking, making connections um, in the brain that wouldn't otherwise surface. And he was a very um, passionate, slightly uh, um, uh, irascible character. And so the calming uh, environment of a bath probably helped as well, helped, helped, uh, helped him focus his thinking. But it's a nice example of something which no corporation would naturally think of doing. So uh, uh, tolerating that kind of eccentricity, frankly, um, is one of the interesting challenges for an organization, particularly a company, trying to engender creativity. You know, you've got to be allowed, you've got to allow people to uh, work in the way that they want to up to a point. Uh, and his is a kind of extreme example. He's also I a great example. Yeah. I wonder if you got inspiration from that. From um, I was uh, I was recently in a place called Ortesia near Syracuse in it Italy, and about two and a half thousand years ago there was a king, King Hero, uh, his name, and um, he was trying to figure out a problem. And he did like what I guess many business senior people do today is they bring in a management consultant and the management consultant was Archimedes and and we had the, the story of like the, the bath and jumping at the bath Eureka so I wonder if he was had a bit of an Archimedes thing kind of going on there as well yeah maybe and he was a, a classicist himself so he would have known the work of Archimedes well and of course that was a brilliant scientific breakthrough in itself he had bathing giving him the idea of the volume measuring volume yeah um but I yeah I, I and it good example of a non-mathematician everybody thinks computing in, is about mathematics but in his case he was a papyrologist so he spent his much of his career trying to piece together these little fragments of papyrus that have been found in the sands of egypt around sort of mid, mid to late 19th century um and he uh tried to put these together to restore the poetry that was written on them and I think the interesting thing about that is is the puzzling theme that runs through the book. You know, all these people loved puzzles. 
And for him, the puzzle actually wasn't about, it wasn't like a jigsaw. It wasn't just finding little bits of papyrus and making them fit together, though that helped. The real puzzle was that the people writing the poems on these bits of papyrus um, weren't the original authors. So they were copying them out two, three centuries later. And so the challenge for him was to work out the mistakes they'd made. So these were scribes who were often bored, didn't really understand what they were copying, didn't really care very much, made mistakes, human error. And there are big lessons in code breaking. So a lot of the progress that was made in Bletchley Park in breaking German codes was about understanding the people at the other end and the mistakes they were making, the human errors. Same is true now in cybersecurity. It's trying to understand the human errors in, in cybersecurity, defense and offense. So he's a well, good example then, all around it. And when you think of, when people think of Bletchley Park, they often think of the the, the movie kind of highlighting Alan Turing and, and, uh, and, uh, I, I always kind of push against that. I sense that you you kind of pushed against a little bit in the book, although it was it was, it was amazing in telling that story and it was it brought to attention the work of Bletchley Park to a wider group of people. But my bugbear, I guess, with that was always that it kind of does the whole lone creative genius thing. Yeah. And in the book, you talk about really that's um, that's kind of not how it worked. So I mean, maybe if you can give us some ideas in terms of what at that point when they're breaking these codes. What was around, for example, Alan Turing? Who was he? Who was he working with? How was the the collaboration side working there? So you're absolutely right, James. I mean, the imitation game was great for the profile of Bletchley Park, um, and actually, big, big increase in visitor numbers in the years that followed. So I'm not knocking it, but it was very Hollywood. It was all about you know good and bad, goodies and baddies in Bletchley, and it was also all about this, as you say, this lone solitary genius. Now, no question, Turing was a genius. Uh, by any measure, but he wasn't a loner in his work. He very much works as part of a team. Um, and in Breaking Enigma, he relied very heavily on the fantastic work of Polish mathematicians before the war, of French mathematicians, um, and he acknowledged all that. And then those around him in Bletchley were absolutely critical to him. So he wasn't this sort of lone person who just cracked it. Um, and the other thing I think that doesn't quite come across in, in the film is Joan Clark, his sometime fiancé for it wasn't for very long but um who uh, was a really talented a uh, code breaker in her own right and mathematician and after the war she went on to work at gchq until the 1970s and in fact just as she was working on counter u-boat counter submarine work in bletchley with turing she ended up working against argentine submarines in the falklands war in 1982 so she had a remarkable career in her own right and she wasn't just the fiancé of Alan Turing. So the film gets lots of things wrong. But um, overall, as you say, it was great for the, great for the profile. There, there was another type of crit. You mentioned the, the relationship with him and his fiancé wife at one point as well. Um, was in the, in the US, you have the National Security Agency, which is, I guess is the equivalent of our GCHQ in the UK. And you talk about Elizabeth and William Friedman there. I believe like William Friedman was the founder of, of America's NSA. But you talk about how, I, I, I use this term, creative pairs. They can operated, they had very different ways of looking at problems and challenges, uh, but they kind of lent something to each other. Can you talk about that relationship? Because I thought that was, that was an interesting one. I'd like to maybe kind of learn a little bit, go and maybe read a little bit more about that couple. Yeah, so there's some wonderful books on them, actually. And there's a there's a wonderful parallel story going on in the US alongside what's happening um, in the First World War in, in the UK and then Bletchley Park. Um, and at the same time, uh, these big characters emerge. So William and Elizabeth Friedman, uh, as the, in a way, the founders of, of uh, US code breaking, US crypt, crypt, cryptology. Um, and uh, they met in this weird uh, scientific research establishment in Chicago and outside Chicago uh, just before the First World War. And um, it was run by an incredible man who's worth reading about, but um, called, called George Fabian, who had this obsession, we had lots of obsessions, but one of his obsessions was that Shakespeare plays weren't really, really written by Shakespeare. Um, they were written by Francis Bacon. And so he hired all these people and, and to try to prove this. And um, in trying to prove it, so William and Elizabeth met, um, spent the rest of their life together, and they um, they conclusively uh, established that actually Francis Bacon hadn't written these, and it wasn't in secret code, um, much to George Fabian's disappointment. 
Um, but they're an amazing couple because I think you're right. They complement each other. Elizabeth had her own career in the 30s against uh, smuggling during the Prohibition era. And it's only actually in this century that, that her contribution has been recognized by the uh, U.S. government and by Congress in particular. She tended to get overshadowed by William. Um, but actually, William himself would have been the first to say she was an amazing um, co-breaker in her own right. So these partnerships are important. Um, and there's a, an interesting story about the two of them in the First World War trying to break a particular machine that had been given them to test, a British machine, actually. Um, and it, William asks Elizabeth to close her eyes and say the first thing, clear her mind, say the first thing that comes into her uh, head when he says a particular word. And uh, she gets it right, of course. And they put that down to gender, actually. They said maybe there's a different way of looking at this. Williams was very structured. Hers was more creative and fluid. Um, yeah, it, it may or may not be right, but it's certainly true, as you say, James, that partnerships sparking off each other, teamwork, is absolutely central to creativity. It isn't, on the whole, a, a solitary pursuit. And then towards the, the, maybe the, the last quarter of the book, you move into talking about kind of just picking up on that about gender, but also talking about uh, diversity of thought and, and also wider like neurodiversity as well. There was one stat in it that really blew my mind that um, we find it here one in four people that work at GCHQ are neurodivergent and uh, which I thought was was fascinating. Um, and then there was, you were kind of, took, as you were kind of getting into this, you were just talking about, uh, you know, people obviously with, with autism. Uh, my father is a musician and he has synesthesia. So he, yeah. he sees musical notes as certain colors. And you talk about that and the benefit of that for code, for code breakers as well. You mentioned briefly, and I think in Israel, they have a, I think it's called Unit 9900, which is made up of people with specific uh, forms of neurodivergence. So tell us, as you were kind of researching and kind of lear learning about it, was this just something you were kind of picking up on because you were just around different people time and you were kind of noticing this pattern? Or was there something else that kind of led you down this path to, to want to investigate this area more? I, I'm fascinated by this area. And uh, although if you look at Bletchley Park, there were lots of people who were clearly uh, neurodivergent. Um, it wasn't called that in those days. It tended to be seen as eccentricity or just uh, oddness. Um, but when I got to GCHQ and I'd spent yeah, 15 years uh, in and around it before I became director, I would just met more and more staff who had really interesting um, views of the world and perceptions of the world. Uh, and I started to talk to them and then to research more about what the university was and just how diverse it is actually as you say the synesthesia is a fascinating example of how the brain works and shows how little we understand about it but i give one example in the book where i was chatting to someone um, who was overlooking the car park and um, the, the the building of gchq's headquarters is a is a donut shaped building it's very similar to what apple have now done in cupertino um, and around it is this massive car park and looking out at this uh, every day, he would say, you know, he felt compelled to organize that and explain the distribution of cars. Um, whereas to the rest of us, we would probably just accept, well, people park and they, they you know, get out and they go into work. He felt this compulsion to systematize that. And of course he was right, it wasn't random. So this is about putting order into the world and finding patterns. And he was absolutely right, because not only was there a computer program booking system for the car park, which was complex, but all the trends of you know, economics, of car sales, of where people lived, of their school runs, um, all those things um, influenced the organization of those cars around the building. And while the rest of us might just you know, not even think about it, he was he felt a compulsion to explain it every day. And I think... Um, that is interesting in itself, but it's also a massive advantage uh, in a creative team to have people who think like that, who are systematizing brains, if you like, um, and all the other neurodivergent uh, traits that, that um, I explore in the book, all of which blended with other people in a team can be massively powerful. And one of GCHQ's and the secret world's great strengths has been able to value that and say, mm. these people are not a problem there are huge advantages. They may need extra support. They may need understanding. They may need the right conditions in which to work. But actually, they're a fantastic asset. And you give the Israeli example. I mean, I think 
um, I, I'm not sure I'd go as far as saying we need to employ certain types of neurodivergence in certain jobs, but uh, for sure the blend of these different types of thinking and ways of looking at the world is, is massively powerful in creativity. What, what advice would you give if someone's listening to this just now? Maybe they're so they're not in this in the world. Most of us not in the world of the counterintelligence and, and code breaking and things like that. But we do have to manage people. Often in large organisations, but you're managing a, a big mix. You have you know you mentioned you're diverse uh, people within the organisation. You also have generational differences. That a lot I know a lot of leaders I speak to. They said they really they struggle with figuring out you know everything from baby boomers to to gen z to gen x to millennials like working with them what what can manage management more broadly learn from the way that organizations like gchq manage that diversity of employees that's a great question james and it's the one i get asked most often by sort of board level people and managers um and i think three just three quick examples i mean one is around recruitment the way most companies recruit staff militates against those kinds of people um, because they're very often very open questions uh, designed to, to explore competence, competencies. Um, that is the worst possible kind of interview for many people with neurodivergent conditions who need something much more structured. So thinking about and getting advice on how you recruit is really important. Once you've recruited people who, have, who are neurodivergent, you need to support them. So that might be very practical things like computer programs um, that help them, but it may also just be really good line management. Okay? You have to invest a lot of time um, and you have to accept that there's going to be some disruption. And one of the interesting things about Bletchley is the leader, the first leader of Bletchley, Alistair Denniston, spent a lot of his time protecting his staff from criticism from outside, particularly from senior military in Whitehall, who would say, you know, these people are scruffy, they are... Uh, yeah, they're, they're too young, they're arrogant, they're, they're telling me um, what to do, they don't respect authority, you need to do something about it. And he would push back and say, no, you know, you've got to accept that if you want the amazing things they're doing, you've got to accept some of the difficulties that come along the way um, in this unusual group of people, as he put it. That takes courage in a leadership management context. So. Yeah, there are some definitely some lessons on how to do it, practical and cultural. Well, one of the ones that I read, which I had never seen before, where you talked about, you called it tea parties, uh, where yeah. uh, Bletchley, because of the work of the shift system, they work in 20, these shifts all the time. Um, someone would come in and they would sit and they would write down a challenge, an idea, something up on a, uh, it could be an equation up on a board, a, white, uh, a whiteboard. And then the next team that were coming in can almost kind of look at that idea and, and pick it apart or figure it out or, or that would maybe spark them as well uh, do you um well going into any competences what is the what is the modern is there a modern equivalent of that to ensure that you're using this hive mind this collective consciousness well yeah it's a it, it's an absolutely key part of the culture of Bletchley that's been carried through gcsq to to, to the current uh, moment actually and and there are two sides to it really one is having those opportunities for people to discuss and feed in informally their thoughts about how to do things better. And the second key thing is to, to stop that being hierarchical. So there was always a principle in GCHQ that any member of staff, so getting on for 10,000 at some periods, could approach the director directly through email. And now that could be a burden at times, but actually it's really important. And um, it, it goes back to the power of young people as well. Actually, most people, as I said, were under 30. Um, and you have to accept that some of them will have absolutely brilliant, groundbreaking ideas and be able to do things that all their senior, distinguished colleagues haven't thought of or haven't been able to do. And to allow that to happen, you've got to have some tea parties, as they were called at Bletchley. Um, we would have, call them something different in modern GCHQ, but get different disciplines together to discuss problems. Um, but you've also got to allow uh, the most junior, youngest people to have their ideas and have their say, because that's often where the, the magic comes from. And there have been some good examples post Bletchley of exactly that happening with people straight out of university coming up with amazing, amazing cryptological solutions. Now, you also said something in the, in the book, which I thought was interesting in, in light of what's going on in many organizations today, where 
you know, uh, the general thing is, you know, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. You know, there's certain like things in, in many organizations that they don't talk about. But I thought it was quite interesting that um, in terms of like politics, talking about these ideas uh, is does seem to be quite open within within the, uh, the organization. I don't know where that just that came from a Bletchley thing or if that's more more recent, because I know that many organizations, they they tend to stay, you know, keep let's keep all that very separate. But you, you seem to embrace it in some ways. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I wouldn't go uh, overboard on, on so it's not party politics, I think. So it's mm. important that, um, you know, these are apolitical organizations and it's written into the law, actually, that those running these agencies uh, must be apolitical um, and, and implement within the law, implement the wishes of the government of the day. Um, but I think what's different about the secret world is uh, you, you're not allowed to take anything home. So you can't take your work home. You can't discuss your work at home with your family and friends. And so there's a kind of world inside which you're working where you have to have an outlet for some things. Um, and if you're thinking of the ethics of intelligence gathering and intrusion into privacy that goes with uh, intelligence agency, it's really important that people can uh, express any ethical concerns and discuss them and have them addressed. You don't want to have that kind of bubbling away. It's also important, you know, to make sure that we maintain the highest standards, ethical standards, and, um, and a huge amount of effort goes into um, adherence to the law, into legal advice, but also into ethical considerations. Um, so giving staff an outlet to discuss that is really important. And one of the parallels in the book um, is with the John Lewis partnership. So we'll meet a lot of people in the UK, not, not so much outside, but it's a, a mutual um, a very successful um uh, department store and, and, and grocers um, and they had pioneered this in the early part of the last century for their staff and they have a gazette which uh, still exists I think where people would um, express their views on all sorts of things um, and one of the key people at Bletchley came from there and indeed there was a big, big interchange between the two organisations over the years but one of them inherited a lot of these um, management uh, processes and brought them into Bletchley um, which is probably part of why they were so successful. But who would have thought it, it would yeah. come from a, de a department store? The, and the other thing I think most of the time, I know um, you and I, we, we speak at different conferences, different public events um, or for companies. And um, in my role, I'm usually the, the I guess, the tech optimist. Uh, you talk about utopians. I'm usually po painting a more utopian picture. of. I, I kind of talk about the, the dangers, but probably 80% of what I'm sharing is these are amazing things that are going to happen you know uh in in gchq and in, in that that those services is almost like that is flipped <laughs> and yeah. your job is to look at the dangers the risks in these things how these things will will affect it so is is this an organization of pessimists or is it just <laughs> clear-eyed folks that are there that's a really interesting question because obviously they're mostly tech people themselves or you know, in, in, interested in and inspired by technology. So it's an organization of optimists who are in, enthused and excited about the technology as, as you are yourself, James. I guess that what makes a difference is that their job is to focus on the bad things that could happen. So what, what are bad people with bad intentions going to do with this technology in the future? Because technology itself is kind of ethically neutral on the whole. Uh, it's all about what people do with it. And how will it be abused is a question which the big tech companies are never going to put front and center, partly because they're, they're utopians, they're optimists, partly because it doesn't make commercial sense. You know, you don't spend a lot of money developing a product, push it out and say, by the way, we're worried that this might, might be, might have to do it. So take social media, for example. They've spent 30 years saying, this is great, building communities, connecting people, all that fantastic stuff. Um, but they haven't said, well, all the bad things that can be done with it from you know election interference through to uh, uh, the impact on teenagers you know it, it's um, those are things which have kind of been forced on them uh, and so I think getting the balance right I mean overall I am an optimist too and I think you know, primarily I would say you know, technological advantages are fantastic and they're bringing human progress forward at an incredible rate well, as you know better than anyone um, but uh, to do that completely without looking at the downsides is is a real risk and so it's quite useful to have some agencies whose job is to look at 
how these might be abused in the future. Now, bring it back to your own work. I'm, as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, hey, you're just touching on AI. You're just touching on quantum computing. And I thought, is this where the next book, books are perhaps going to go for, for you? But where, where do you go to get creative inspiration? You mentioned in, in the book about the donut, GCHQ has a garden in the middle, which I love the idea of that. We often get inspiration when we're out in nature or that color green is around us. But also you have these open plan offices, which I know for some people can cause real stress, especially if you're more quiet person. So you have what they call caves and marketplaces. But for you, where do you go to get inspired? Where do you go to think about these big ideas and, and ways of, of solving them? And, and actually in your writing as well. So I do go outside. I do like the, uh, I like, to be out in 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 nature um i do find that inspiring i also find sort of talking to people wandering around just seeing what they're doing inspiring which is a very literally gchq thing to do actually just to kind of wander around and chat to people um i'm not sure that you can uh prescribe that different people find different things uh good for their creativity from baths as you said to earlier to to sitting in a garden um, if you're lucky enough to have a garden that's accessible, not everybody does. I mean, your point about mathematicians and what they need is something that's kind of occupied a lot of my time, both at GCHQ and also now I'm in a university in Oxford and we think a lot about the architecture, how that helps or hinders academics to think. And um, there have been some wonderful examples of uh, institutions for math mathematicians which um, try to blend that time alone that they need almost a kind of monastic cell to go and mm. think but the interchange of ideas the sort of marketplace as you say where they can be sociable and exchange ideas um, if you get that wrong you can significantly damage um, the potential for creativity uh, by just limiting the environment in which it can happen so it's really important i think the built environment the natural environment are really important to creativity yeah it's like the genius loci, the places themselves have their exactly. own creative genius. They, they can inspire their own genius as well. Absolutely. Just a couple of back, quick... Back to the classics. Yeah. Back to the classics. So quick, quick fire as we just start to finish up now. Um, is there a book you, you've personally been reading just now that has just kind of got you thinking differently? And if anyone that's interested in maybe creativity, innovation, technology, future trends, where the world may be going, is there one book you would recommend people check out just now? Uh, if I'm absolutely honest, I tend not to read uh, books about uh, those kinds of uh, uh, those kinds of technology developments. Um, I prefer to talk to people, but I ought to read the tech press. There's a lot going on in the tech press, which uh, I find very uh, inspiring. Um, and I tend to read fiction. So uh, I'm reading Long Island at the moment, um, which uh, I think is great. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I try to, I try not to read too many of the, there are some very good ones out there, but I try not to read too many of the kind of predictions of the future books, partly because I think a lot is being written about AI that is not particularly helpful, a yeah. lot of hype around AI, uh, but of course AI actually was a big part of AI. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's one of my things. As I watch more like TV shows, they have a very dark view of where we're we're going as a civilization in the future. And and I, I hope that we have more interesting storytellers. Uh, there are some amazing things that, that we had um, where we had uh, um, uh, Sir David Ormond on, former colleague of yours. We were talking about the three body problem, and uh, there's there is really interesting fiction going on just now. Um, wonderful book so counterintelligence what the secret world can teach us about problem solving and creativity robert hannigan it's been a pleasure speaking to you if people want to learn more about you and your work i know you're in, heavily involved in different universities i think you're in the bletchley trust as well um where can people go to learn more about you uh well i've got a website roberthannigan.com or um there are more details in the book and the proceeds of the book go to bletchley so um uh, but it's been a real pleasure, James, and thank you very much. Uh, I think podcasts are a great way of exploring these things. It's uh, probably more dynamic than books, actually, so it's great, <laughs> great to be here. Well, Robert Hannigan, thank you so much for being a guest on the Super Creativity Podcast. Thanks, James. You can subscribe to the Super Creativity Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. While you're there, leave us, leave us a review. I would really, really appreciate it. I'm James Taylor, and you've been listening to the Super Creativity Podcast.